Hello everyone, my name is David. Thank you for watching this video. Today I want to talk to you about how to create an INFJ. What on earth does that mean? Um, what I thought we'd do is sort of run down the, some of the differences between cognitive functions and how that affects personality. And if you were to create an INFJ out of thin air, some kind of person or whatever thing, capybara, I don't know, it doesn't matter, and make it an INFJ, what would you do? How would you apply uh, personality traits to it? And what personality traits would you apply? It's an interesting exercise in seeing what some of our similarities are. And so as we step through it, uh, I kind of want to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to use an example of a character from a story that I have, that I was writing and then stopped writing for a while because I jumped to another story because I can't actually finish anything without starting something completely new. That's much cooler. It's a thing. So let's do an intro and then we'll get right to some other stuff and then we'll get to that. Just stick with me, all right? Just hang on. Here we go. Okay, so before I get into creating an INFJ, just a couple of little updates in regards to the channel and some things that are going on. First one is, I am awful close to 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Hooray! I need like a thing, like a fur or something. Um, and what I wanted to do, and I asked this question on the community page, is what would you like to see? And uh, the overwhelming responses were for a Q&A session. So sweet, let's do a Q&A session. Now, the way I'm doing this is I'm hooking it up to Instagram. So please head over to my Instagram page, look for this post. I'll try and hopefully it's there. Um, and then comment on that post with a question that you have, and I will answer it on the video whenever I hit that 10,000 mark, which should be, according to YouTube, I have no idea because I really don't know how their algorithm works in general. And I don't know if I'm like pleasing the YouTube gods right now. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to like put a TV on the floor and put like a like a troll doll on it and then like set it on fire and chant something. And then you'll get to 10,000 subs. Like, I really don't know. I'm just hoping to get there at some point soon. And if it works out within the next few weeks, and then I'll do this video for you. Second, aliens are among us. And many of you are watching, you know, I use that term to affectionately refer to uh, INFJ friends because we often do feel alien in this world. So I have this thing where I can't let one comment go unreplied to. So I'm going to have to start figuring out a different way to do that because it is not very efficient. So what I thought was, where can we go as aliens to create a little home where we can all talk and chat and be comfy with one another and hang out? So I'm looking into Discord as an option. If you don't know what Discord is, you can get it as an app on your phone. It is free. You can use it on a web interface. You can have it installed on a computer as an app. And it's really cool. It's kind of like... Um, it was intended for gamers originally, but it's sort of like a Skype for communities. And so I thought, well, let's try and start perhaps a community of people, um, you know, all of you that are watching the channel. And uh, I certainly want to hang out on there and interact with you. And so I'm looking into that and hopefully doing some beta testing on it within the next couple of months, a uh, month or two. And I will be throwing a link to that for you guys to check it out in a preliminary way before I launch this and help me out. The link will be going on the community page on the YouTube channel. So I'll be putting up there first. So please, pretty please subscribe and hit the bell and make sure you turn your notifications on and then you can see what happens on that community page. You will get notifications of this and then we can hang out on Discord and we can talk and all sorts of cool things will happen. Discord's pretty neat. It's like a big room, kind of like there's like a big chat room, but then there's other like other little chat rooms you can have. So you can have like a little INFJ room where INFJs can hang out and a writing room where we could talk about writing stuff if you want to do that. And like a romance room where you... No, no shenanigans in the romance room. Let's not do that. On to the subject of this video and many trolls complaining that the subject of the video didn't start until a few minutes into it. I'm really sorry. I just, I talk and I like you guys. It's been a little while since we've been able to hang out like this. So I just wanted to have a chat. Is that so bad? No, it's not. We're just, we're just hanging out. So creating an INFJ, I'm going to throw a picture up of a uh, sketch that I had commissioned for a character in a book that I was, that I had started and not finished. Because if you don't have a bunch of unfinished projects lying around, who are you even? This particular character's name is Avery. And my goal when I started this story, this is not the one that I'm looking to have published very, very soon. That is a completely separate story, which is a bit more serious than 
this one that Avery is in. Uh, Avery is in a story about a zombie apocalypse, and he is a very insecure INFJ that is in love with a girl, and she is friends with him, and she doesn't love him back. And uh, he basically has to fight through a zombie apocalypse to either save her or save humanity, which is, of course, what every INFJ wants to do, have uh, the lives of many people or one person that they love with all of their heart in the balance. And so it was meant as kind of a, a funny story. And so it, it has that, that kind of flavor to it. When I started this out, I had to go through this thought process of, okay, I want Avery to be an INFJ. I'm more comfortable writing people who are insecure and kind of disasters in their daily life. Gee, I wonder why, whatever. So it was a, a tough task. Like, how do you write somebody as an INFJ so that people that know will recognize them? And this led me down this rabbit hole of cognitive functions and personality behaviors and how those two things link up. So while we're stepping through some of these things, and I'm just mentioning some of them on here, I want you to sort of think about your own behaviors. How do you recognize another INFJ? Because you can't recognize them just crossing them on the street. You're not like passing somebody and saying, oh, look, they're using their uh, cognitive function, uh, the subconscious cognitive function of internal intuition. Like that doesn't happen. You can't see it going on in their brain. So we have to look at personality, which is totally different than cognitive functions. I've been saying it a lot lately, but it's really important because then everybody's like, well, INFJs aren't a thing because it's just behavior. Well, it is behavior, but there are many similarities as many of you can attest to, because I see you guys talking in the comments and you're like, oh my God, me too. Oh my God, me too. And so that is a thing. So what I set out to do and what I think is an important first step to do, if you had to create an INFJ from scratch is identify some of the behaviors that are common for INFJs and their source reasoning. So at the end of this, I'm going to read the first chapter of this unfinished book. It's a bit raw, so no grammar police, please. Just like leave me alone and let me read this. Uh, but I want to identify some of the things in there and what I went through to sort of put that impression and that personality on this character to get you, hopefully as a reader, to recognize, hey, that person's an INFJ and perhaps resonate and see some of the behaviors that they have going through in yourself. As a writer, this is what I want to do. I want to create a character that you can identify with and you see some of the same behaviors. And so as an INFJ, I would hope that you would be drawn to that character. That's the whole point. So I actually have some notes that I wrote about my dear friend, Avery, right there. And uh, these are a couple of things. I'm just going to run down these, right? So the first one I wrote down on my list was idealistic thinking. I think as INFJs, we often want to fix people and the world. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and try and do the things that have harmony between people. We do make good counselors. We make uh, good, good people to listen to for advice. We make great people to talk to and everything like that because we have such empathy and we really connect with people. And in idealistic terms, a lot of times we want to be world changers in some way. We have grand dreams and visions and we think really big. And when it comes to details, sometimes we have a little bit of trouble. The second one I wrote down was scatterbrained overthinkers. Let's talk about this for a second. <laughs> scatterbrained. Well, our intuition is a subconscious process. It is hoovering up all kinds of information at any given time. And so we can think in 100 different directions at 100 miles an hour, 100% of the time at any given moment. And it is, it's, it can be very overwhelming. And a lot of times when we get into that pattern of thought where we're just looking at everything all at once, it, it becomes too much. And a lot of times that's as an INFJ, that's when you're going to shut down. You haven't done the self care thing. You're overthinking everything. And then you're like, no, it's cool. Like I'm done. I'm past this. I'm not going to overthink this anymore. And then you go to bed at night <laughs> And you sit there and you overthink it for like nine hours. Anyway, the next one I identified here uh, for a trait that I wanted this character to have was putting others before yourself. Do you do this, my sweet, sweet INFJ friends? Yes, you do. Don't even say no. Um, a lot of times we, we have that problem where we try to take care of somebody else and we try to either fix that person or make sure all of their needs are met. And a lot of times at the detriment of ourself. If you've watched any of my videos, you've probably heard me make this analogy before. When you're in an airplane, before you take off, they play a little video and it says, if there's a loss of cabin pressure and you are having a hard time breathing, this is all metaphorical people, so pay attention, right? That masks will drop down. And if you are with somebody that needs help putting their mask on, 
you put yours on first, then you help them. Well, isn't that a great lesson? So in real life, when you are in that place where something is very challenging, you need to make sure you can breathe and that you are balanced and healthy before you can help somebody else become healthy. Next on my list was seeking validation. And often as INFJs, we have no problem looking at the emotions of others and reading them often in an instant. Like as soon as somebody walks into a room, just that the vibe of it all changes. Your intuition is screaming at you for something saying, Hey, look at this puzzle that I'm putting together. Something's really weird. And you're trying to analyze a situation and you know, something is off with that one person. Maybe they had a bad day. Perhaps it was a breakup. They lost their job or whatever else, but there's something in you that just knows something is off. But then when it comes to how you feel about something, you have no idea what to think. And it's so weird. Like I can see, I can just see the emotions on other people and I can, I can feel that I can read a room really, really well. But then if you ask me how I feel about something, I'm just like, duh, like, I don't know. How am I supposed to feel about it? I actually look towards other people's emotions to try and figure out how I'm supposed to feel about something, which is totally dumb and it's not very healthy, but it just happens. For me, largely as a more mature INFJ, I'm kind of past that point now because I can step back and see things logically and understand and make my decisions accordingly. But we do often find that we need to get some kind of validation. I need to know that I'm being okay and I'm doing okay for somebody and all of those kinds of things because it is, it's that, it's that darn external feeling. I like, it's great. I love it, but it also, it's rough. Another trait that I'd thought about that I wanted a particular character to have, I'm creating an INFJ, is somebody that can connect random thoughts together, uh, seemingly unconnected things and just throwing them together, leading from point A to point B, but it's actually more like point A to point Z with the entire alphabet in there, but eventually you get to the end. You could be sitting there uh, with, with your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend, and you could be laying down and looking at beautiful clouds up in the sky and they're going to say, what are you thinking about in like such a sweet way? And you're going to be looking at the clouds and you're going to be like, um, biscuits and gravy. Well, it's a perfectly logical thought process. Five years ago, when I first met you, we were at an old country buffet and I had ordered biscuits and gravy. And I was, as I was eating them, I embarrassed myself because some of it fell down my chin and onto my jeans and it formed a splatter mark. And that splatter mark looks like that cloud did about 30 seconds ago. It's now gone and it looks like Donald Duck, but that's reminding me of biscuits and gravy. And by the way, I'm hungry. And we tend to have these, we store these little moments and little pieces of things, images of things, stuff that we've seen or heard or whatever else. And then wham, out of nowhere, it just connects. And you're thinking of this totally obscure thing, but in your brain, your intuition's like, oh yeah. And it makes perfect sense. Totally uncorroborated. But I have this feeling that as INFJs, when it comes to things like music and movies or anything that we can dive into that we really enjoy, we tend to collect lots of random facts about it. And those are the things that we will connect in any number of ways at any given moment to something that seems totally, totally random. Another trait, as I was just running down and writing down traits that I thought, okay, this is very INFJ like is being nervous in groups. There's really not much more to say about that one. I think as INFJs, we're pretty uncomfortable in group settings. Uh, maybe not in a group like where I can have a chair in the back and nobody's really looking at me or paying attention to me. But if somebody tries to draw me and throw me into the front of that group, we're not, we're not going up there and, you know, in bunch of, in front of a bunch of strangers and telling our life story in interpretive dance I'm not going to do by the way. So I'm presenting you with this list and this was just my brainstorm over a few minutes of like, okay, these are some traits and personality things. And why do these things occur? Well, it occurs because of the cognitive functions that we're using. So we're using our intuition and we're using that external feeling and, and those things are pulling at us to make it so we are, you know, that's a, a common trait maybe that we are uncomfortable in groups because of the way we use our functions. Our function doesn't make us that way. You cannot say, because I'm an INFJ, I think this. That doesn't work. That's your personality. And everybody has a personality that is very different. You've heard me say this before. Some of us like candy corn and some of us understand that candy corn is trash. So I'm going to read the first chapter, which is just an introduction of this main character, Avery Armstrong. Through this chapter, I tried to use some of these traits, 
honed in by our cognitive functions in order to color uh, Avery as an INFJ in the hopes that somebody reading it would be like, oh my gosh, this guy's like neurotic and he's awkward and that's just like me. When I'm done, at the end of this video, what I would like you to do is list in the comments maybe a couple of traits that you think you would recognize in other INFJs. What kind of a behavioral thing or a personality thing might they have or might they do that would get you to think like, hey, that's that's that very well could be an INFJ because those things do exist. It's actually really fun when you hang out with another INFJ. You could be sitting there in total and complete silence for like 10 minutes and it's fine. It's kind of nice, actually. It is. So this is short. Like I said, it's just a few minutes as a read. So please hang out. Don't shut the video down now. Like, don't be that person. If anything, just like you can just listen to the sultry sounds of my voice and then you can go to sleep to that or something like that. That's fine. If I put you to sleep, it's way better. Just don't turn the video off. I'm going to put the paragraphs up and I'll put underneath, uh, I'll just highlight underneath one of the things, one of those traits that I was thinking of as I wrote that particular part of this. Um, it's actually a lot to pack in, in just 800 words, uh, to be honest. So this is pretty short and uh, I won't read it too slow. I'll just kind of run with it. Uh, so here we go. The <clears throat> uh, first chapter of uh, an unfinished work, uh, the book's working title is Brain Dead. It's a zombie thing, all right? Just whatever. It's all I could come up with at the time. And uh, here's here we go. Avery Armstrong wanted to change the world. He walked down the street, weaving in and out of pedestrians with a stern determination of a 34-year-old man about to be late to his third job in the last six months. Avery knew, deep in his heart, that he wanted to do something that could deliver meaning and purpose to humanity. He needed cash, though, and this was the only gig he could get with a work resume that looked like a graveyard of poor choices, missed opportunities, an embarrassing stint as a mediocre sleight-of-hand magician at children's birthday parties, and that one time he tried being a phone psychic, like Miss Cleo, but a dude. Changing the world was always on hold. Sorry, sorry, excuse me, sorry, he kept repeating as he used his arm to cut the path through everyone else on the street, scurrying through various daily routines. He checked his watch with an exasperated sigh because he couldn't tell what time it was since he left his watch on the kitchen counter. His roommate, Simone, spent an unreasonable amount of time occupying the apartment bathroom this morning. It threw their normal routine into chaos. Simone has been at her job for about three weeks. She was working at a, as a lab assistant at a successful biomedical research company on the outskirts of their hometown. Avery wanted her day to be perfect, so he did everything he could to set her up for success. He made her coffee and breakfast, packed her lunch, filled her car with gas, and did everything he could to ensure that his first day would not go well, he would be late, and may unlock the achievement of being fired before his first minute of work. His dwindling list of close friends often tell him he does too much for others, and most see his apparent and much-denied affection for Simone as adorable, even if it tends to hold him back. But when she gave Avery a grateful hug and a little peck on the cheek, along with that sweet look into his eyes as she said, You're the best and darted off to work, it made any embarrassment worth it. It was all the thanks he needed for sacrificing his morning to help her out. He spotted the sign for his new employer up ahead, hanging at a slight angle. It was faded from years of rain and neglect. Okay, superhero tech support, let's do this, he muttered, as he turned and quick-stepped his way through the entrance and up the stairs to the second floor office, ducking under a low entryway and planting himself in front of the receptionist's desk. Hi, my name is Avery Armstrong, and I'm here for my orientation, he said, trying to catch his breath. The young woman behind the desk was chewing gum with her mouth open, her left hand flipping through a celebrity magazine filled with trashy stories about Hollywood fashion disasters, as her right hand was cupping her phone, thumbing down her Instagram feed. Um, hi, he repeated, louder and slower. My name is Avery Armstrong. I'm here for my orientation. Please. She tilted her head toward him. Her eyes took their time, unsticking themselves from an obnoxious paparazzi magazine. She had been studying a picture of some little-known pop starlet committing the heinous crime of wearing mismatched denim. Her blank expression reminded him of the cold and lifeless vacuum of empty space. Conference rooms down the hall, she said, cracking her gum while still flipping through magazine pages, as her eyes slid from his face to his body, then back to the fashion disasters. I think you're like a few minutes late or whatever. Avery launched himself down the hall, straightening out his long-sleeved white dress shirt. He felt his face produce a flash of heat at the thought of how awkward it would be disturbing an occupied conference room. He imagined judging stares shooting at him like a firing squad. For Avery, 
the firing squad would be preferable to strolling into a group of staring strangers. He placed his hands on the door handle and paused. You know what? He thought to himself. It's time to make a change. Stop being so nervous. Be a new man. Confident. Assertive. Like Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse. Yeah, Dalton. Time to kick ass. He gripped the handle on the conference room door, took a big breath, summoned a mountain of unearned confidence, and used his six-foot-three frame to swing the door open with enough assertiveness that you'd think he owned the place. Halfway into his grand entrance, a cheesy forced smile adorning his face, the door came to an abrupt halt. The only sounds were gasps of shock and the immediate dull thud of a body hitting the floor. So there you go, folks. Uh, the first chapter of the unfinished and may never ever get finished because I'm too busy working on the other book, uh, work of Brain Dead, and your introduction to Avery Armstrong, the INFJ character that I was trying to create. So I hope that was kind of helpful uh, looking through just as I'm posting those up and seeing some of the things that were in my mind as I'm writing and tells and behavioral things that I'm trying to implement into the character to, to get you to recognize him and to get you to resonate with him. Now, how this applies to daily life is, do you see these kinds of behaviors in other people? And if so, does that give you this idea of how you would get along with them? And hey, I have a suspicion that that person might be an INFJ because I see them do this, 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 and this. And is that behavior like your own? So please, pretty please, in the comments, uh, throw some thoughts up on this and some behavioral tells that you think an INFJ might have. And I'm curious to see if we, if we can see some of the same patterns throughout the comments. And as always, go through those. Um, everybody here, like you people are amazing. And I love watching you interact with each other, even though I can't comment really like I can't write lots on your comments. I do love reading all of these and I, I really enjoy seeing you going back and forth with each other and getting to know one another. And so strike up these conversations and then someday soon as aliens, boom, we're going to find our way to discord. Boom. Hopefully you can come there and hang out with us and all of that. Um, and, and we can really start to bring this, bring this whole tribe together in a, in a more cohesive way. I really hope you enjoyed the small piece that I wrote and um, throw some ideas down and get talking to each other and let me see what you have on your mind as far as this goes. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will catch you on the next video.